What is up? You have found I Like the Blazers. I am your host, Brandon Goldner, and I am stoked to share that our guests, yes, guests, plural, today are a couple of super talented writers, audio people, organizers of amazing events. Uh, For both from Blazers Edge, we have Tara Bowen Biggs and Steve DeWalt in the house. Uh, We have a conversation with them by we, I mean the royal we, myself and my two cats, I guess, and my mixing board. Uh, But we all talk about, all three of us talk about the Blazers' early season so far, going three and two in their first five games, talking about Scala BCA's role, if Zach Collins is going to be out for an extended period of time, with Hassan Whiteside out for at least this game against the 76ers that's going to be played today, November 2. Talked about that, Damian Lillard's leadership, and a bunch more. But before we get to that, I really quickly wanted to hit on one specific point, and then we'll get into the interview, which I I very much enjoyed. I just want to talk a little bit about something that we did mention on the pod, which is CJ McCollum's ability to draw fouls or inability to draw fouls. We mentioned it briefly, but I wanted to make one more kind of comment on this, and I sort of led it into the question uh, with Tara and Steve, which is, are the Blazers coaches looking at things like the number of fouls a player draws and is asking them to actively work on them? I think that as someone who's not a coach and who doesn't really understand ego management at the NBA level very well, it's, I think, easy for me to say, hey, look, look at TJ McCollum's ability to draw fouls over his career. He doesn't do a very good job of it. Like, he's only drawing four free throw shots per game in in his first five games this year, which would be a career high. I think it's like 3.9 or something like that. And for somebody who scores as prolifically as he does, shouldn't he be trying to get more foul calls and manufacture easier points, especially because the Blazers have a lot of flux in their roster a lot of new players are trying to incorporate wouldn't be better for them to get easy points and wouldn't one way to do that for CJ McCollum to draw more fouls and again I think the ignorant answer that comes to my mind is well yes like he should be working on that that is something the coaches should emphasize why hasn't he made that a point of emphasis and as I was recording and as I have been kind of going about my day and thinking about it more I just kind of wanted to argue against myself to say, you know what? Certain players have different skills. CJ McCollum's skill, his highest skill is manufacturing points in the mid-range and his floater game. So look, I I mean, I know it sounds simplistic, but CJ's game isn't to draw fouls necessarily. And also he's not like the biggest dude in the world. I don't know how many hits CJ could take. I mean, he's not small by, by any stretch. I mean, he's an NBA player. He's been durable, but uh, I think for someone like me to just wave a hand and say, oh, he should be drawing more fouls is pretty unfair. Uh, it's also true that Damian Lillard draws a ton of fouls. And so when the Blazers do get down to those late game possessions and they need something, they can look to Dame to do that. Um, and it's going to be also interesting to see the development of Anthony Simons and whether or not he is going to be more like CJ and kind of avoiding contact at the rim or going to be more like Damian Lillard trying to draw it. Now, I know that Anthony Simons is like five years old. I know that he's still very slight of build. And, and to be fair, he's 20, um, very slight of build. And when you look at what he's done in the first five games and granted, he's only playing 17 minutes a game, but he's barely getting to the line. He's only going to the line once ever. Well, I mean, let's not even try to do the averages 0.4 free throws per game. He went to the line once so far this season, one time. And that was in the first game against Denver and has not drawn a shooting foul since. I wonder whether that's something that will come along for him, whether it's something he would develop, whether it's something that he will not develop. And it's just interesting when you think about, again, when a team needs points, when you need to get just points up on the board, one way to do that is by drawing fouls. And if you are a ball handler who is expected to be an elite scorer and is expected to have the ball in your hands a lot, It just seems to me that being able to draw fouls should be part of your toolkit. But again, I think that there's a lot that I don't understand about coaching, player development. Obviously, there is. I don't think there's a lot that I don't understand about coaching, player development, ego management, and all that stuff that goes into, hey, look, guard-sized player. We want you to draw more fouls. So it's not just as simple as that. I guess I'll just end my weird tirade arguing against myself with this. It's something I would look to 
Uh, it's something that I would want the Blazers to look at, maybe not on an individual basis, but as a team, just trying to pay attention to how many fouls they're drawing. As of right now, in the NBA, they are actually right in the middle of the pack in free throws attempted. Uh, they do happen to be 29th out of 30 and the number of free throws they give up, but that's something else altogether having to do with their defense. And that's, we can save that for another, n- another day. But as a team, it turns out that they are doing a thoroughly average job in these first five games of drawing free throws. And by the way, top five and free throw percentage at nearly 83%, which is pretty good. So all of this is just to say, I would like CJ to draw more fouls. Probably not going to happen. There's probably a good reason for it. So uh, there you go. Again, the Blazers are playing the 76ers tonight, uh, November 2. They then play the Golden State Warriors uh, back on the road and then on the road again against the Clippers on Thursday. So there's some gaps in between these games. We got tonight, Saturday, Warriors on Monday, Clippers on Thursday, the back home against the Brooklyn Nets Friday, and then back home again against the Hawks on Sunday. Those are the next five games. We talked about those next five games a little bit with Tara and Steve. And so with that, without further ado, I would like to welcome our guests, Tara Bowen Biggs and Steve DeWald of Blazers Edge. Here we go. Tara and Steve, I appreciate you taking the time on this super sunny afternoon. Uh, how's it going? Tara first. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it is so gorgeous outside right now. I love this time of year because I love it when Blazer games, when it's still light out. And this is probably the last one where we're going to have any light before the game because tomorrow's daylight savings and that's all going to go out the window. Oh, man. I, yeah, go. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm at the point of no return whether or not I need to mow my lawn one more time before winter comes. So I'm, I'm a curmudgeon when it's this nice this late in the year. I'm ready for rain and for me to put everything away and not have to worry about it. You, you got to do that last mow. The only problem is you might get, I mean, while it's November, you might have a couple bees who are still out there and they're super angry. Um, those things don't feel good. Uh, <laughs> I still uh, have no. a couple weeks left of soccer practice, so I need it to stay nice for at least a couple more weekends do you do oh so you do outdoor outdoor soccer stuff yeah i'm coaching for special olympics oh that's amazing i i mean not that i do you want to just give a quick blurb about that that just sounds incredible Oh, it is. And I'm actually, I, I'm totally doing it because Damian Lillard is a Special Olympics ambassador. And that's what got me started. And I just love it. We've got a soccer team and they had a tournament last weekend, spent a whole day out in the gorgeous, gorgeous uh, sunshine out in, um, let's see, what was that? In Clackamas County. And uh, we got another tournament coming up in a couple of weeks. So we're just getting ready for that. And I love it and having an awesome time with some amazing athletes and amazing people. That's so cool. That's right. Uh, Speaking of soccer, my girlfriend Cassie is into soccer. I've never played before in my life, but I have bought cleats. I got shin guards. I'm going to start playing even though I'm about to turn 35, but I guess you can teach an old dog new tricks. But enough about soccer. Uh, Let's talk about Blazers basketball. I wanted to start With a pretty basic question for both of you, the Blazers have played five games. They're three and two. They just went three and one on that road trip, which was really good to see. And I'll start with you, Steve, Uh, with this three and two start, been some ups, been some downs. Um, Has there been anything in particular that's jumped out at you that's particularly surprising or interesting or anything that you're just keeping your eye on so far early in the season? I think from an interesting standpoint, I think having a guy like Kent Bazemore on the team has been really fascinating to watch. It can be frustrating at times seeing him on offense, trying to see where he actually belongs, might prolong some possessions with just dribbling the ball into the ground. But defensively, he's an absolute blast to watch. I mean, he is all over the court. He's in passing lanes. And really, Stotts' system really hasn't allowed players to kind of move around that much and kind of play more of a risky style of defense. So that's been something that's given me a reason to get excited to watch defense for the Blazers this year. Yeah. I mean, I'm hoping that he assimilates more into the offense as time goes on. As of right now, averaging eight points on just 37% shooting from the field. Um, But like you said, has been amazing on defense. Tara, what's popped out at you so far in these first five games? 
Well, somebody that I've had my eye on and been excited about all summer was, is Scal, and I never, ever would have wanted him to get more minutes because of somebody else's injury, but I'm very curious to see uh, how he's going to be doing if the if Zach Collins is, in fact, going to be out for a while. I also was just kind of loving Zach Collins's defense, and to Steve, to kind of add on to you, it's been fun watching just something new and different like Bazemore is just different a different player than we've seen for a while and so just like retraining my eyes to watch who these new players are that has been very interesting to me I I found it to be the same the retraining of the eyes thing have either of you had that like you're watching the game and in years past because the team has remained more or less the same you're like oh like you see that the way they run or just the way they look, looking at their back, you know who it is. And this year, it's like, I don't know who I'm looking at. I have to look at the number, look at the name. Like, are you finding you have to, like, kind of, like, relearn the players on the court? Because I definitely am. I, I think just where they are in certain situations, just that's not where Al Farouk Aminu normally stood. Yeah. Like, what is Anthony Tolliver doing out there? You know, so just little things like that, like you mentioned. But, uh and then just watching guys kind of learn and slowly adapt. Like you're watching guys like Anthony Simon slowly get more and more confidence in the system. And you're, and you're seeing Baysmore who's integrating into the offense, realizing when he misses a pass or when he kind of stalls the offense out. And that's, it's all part of the process. And then it also has made me appreciate some of the things that Yusuf Nurkic did in the past, as far as being able to get the ball off pick and rolls really easy and really kind of make himself available and a big target. And it's, it's odd watching Damian Lillard kind of adapt to that again, all over again, and use these new target guys. Yeah, to pick up piggyback on what you were saying, Steve, uh, you know, one of the things that I was very curious going into this year was how was Damien going to react to not having his regular screen setters, you know, because between Yusuf Nurkic and uh, Myers Leonard also, you know, even Al Farouk Aminu, like he was used to uh, running certain screens and getting a certain amount of space based on how those former big guys were playing. And wow, things seems a, a lot more uh, crowded uh, at this point where they're all start getting used to running those plays. Like the, some of the plays are the same, but some of the plays are just completely different. So that's another part of like retraining my eyes. Like I had just gotten used to like what it looked like when, you know, CJ curls around Myers and it's like, okay, now we don't have that anymore. Yeah. I mean, with so many new players, I think they lost like 70% of their starters minutes, either to injury and use of Nurkic or to people being traded away and not being on the team anymore. It's definitely a different look. I wanted to ask one more question about Bazemore and then Tara, to your point about Scal um, after that with Bazemore, there is, I mean, there have been a lot of plays that have been like hustle plays, energy plays, those plays where it's just like, look, you just have to want it more than the other person. There was a jump ball late in the game. I think it was against the Spurs where he saved it from almost going out of bounds. Maybe it was against the Mavericks. It's all kind of blurring together already. But do you think, let me ask Steve this, do you think that Kent Bazemore, the energy that he brings on defense and just the passion with which he plays the game, I don't mean to be blasphemous with this, but do you think that he could be a fan favorite fan favorite in the way that Wesley Matthews was that he brought that like energy, that essence of like, we care about this game. Is that something that you think Bazemore can maybe inject into this team? And please say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, as much as I'd like to say yes, I think the dynamic of when Wesley kind of, became what he was for Portland. There was a little bit of a power vacuum between Brandon Roy's exit and the emergence of Damian Lillard as that backcourt leader. So I think trying to replicate that is almost impossible now. But as far as on the court production goes, I think these guys who have been, you know, taking an unorthodox path to the league, you have a guy like Kent Bazemore who had to grind his way onto a roster. I think that type of attitude is extremely useful for especially the young guys like Gary Trent Jr. and Anthony Simons and Nasir Little. But I think that rubs off on everybody. And he had a great quote with Jason Quick a few weeks ago, or maybe it was Joe Free. It was after one of the practices. But just talking about, you know, I wake up to play defense. And I think that's something. 
Portland hasn't probably had since a guy like Wesley Matthews is there. So, so I, I can see it, but I just don't know if everyone's ever going to reach that level quite for me as Wesley. Well, Matthews that's, that's did. true. But speaking of a vacuum, the Blazers do have a vacuum, uh, a need for perimeter defense, which is something that he and probably on this team he alone can bring. I wonder if maybe some of that will just come out of necessity. Tara, what do you think? Is Kent Bazemore the new Wesley Matthews? Please say yes. <laughs> Uh, Well, you know, for me, yeah, he has a very similar feel when he steps on the court because he brings a lot of intensity. But the thing that, uh, you know, I I loved Wesley Matthews always just playing on a chip on his shoulder. And he always seemed like slightly mad, like every time somebody else won the ball. And with uh, Bazemore, he just brings this like he just seems so happy every time he steps out on the court. And like the first time he, you know, dove into the crowd during fan fest that pretty much won me over if somebody could um you want to show so badly how glad he was to be there and how much he wanted to contribute from like the very first play of a you know a scrimmage that was really exciting to me i see what you mean steve about you know wesley matthews not only was a, a guy who brought defensive energy and you know a special kind of feeling to the court once he stepped out on it but at that point he was also kind of taking on um a leadership and filling in um some of that while damian was getting his feet under him you know in that sort of situation and like baseball doesn't need to do that he just seems like a guy who's just so happy to be there and so happy to be playing basketball and i just love watching players who just seem so happy to, who just love playing the game Me too and it feels like and I think Steve mentioned this before how that affects other players I think that's a real thing and this is maybe a, a topic for a different podcast but when we talk about analytics and advanced stats it's really just a way of trying to measure stuff that is happening on the court it's a way of measuring things that are happening that can affect the game in positive or negative ways. I wish that we had advanced statistics for caring, that we had advanced statistics for energy, <laughs> because that is a real thing that affects the game for good or for bad. Um, and I do think that if you had a, if you had a metric for that, that Kent Bazemore would be way high up there. Let's do talk about Scala BCA. Uh, Tara, you mentioned him before, and I, as we talked a little bit before the podcast, was mentioning. Um, I mean, we all were about how important he's going to be given that the Blazers are without Yusuf Nurkic. They're going to be without Zach Collins. As of today, the recording on November two, we still don't have a timeline for Zach Collins return from that shoulder injury. And that Hassan Whiteside has twisted or hyperextended his knee and he was coming off of an ankle injury in training camp. So the Blazers are, are they're going to be needing bigs. And to my eye, Scala BCA has looked a little bit better watching him play, knowing which spots to being, uh, kind of following Dame on drives and getting those offensive rebounds. He's looked better to me by my eye than he has on paper. Um, and the last two games has been playing a, a more and more important role. Tara, let me ask you this. Scal was pretty highly touted when he first got into the league, especially by, you know, speaking of analytics, people who are very familiar with them and like Nate Duncan, Daniel LaRue, if you listen to the Dunked On podcast, they talked a lot about how good they thought Scal BCA would be. He's still in his early 20s. Do you think that maybe this is the opportunity, the time and the place and the opportunity he needs to maybe fulfill some of that promise that he had when he first got into the league? Well, sure. I mean, isn't it? hasn't pretty much everybody <laughs> experienced that once they got to Portland. Yeah. Uh, when you look, I, I actually went down the rabbit hole of scowl uh, highlights yesterday. I was watching some of his games in Sacramento uh, and he was demonstrating a lot of the same moves that we see now, um, but he wasn't alongside Damian Lillard when he was doing it. And one of the things that I've noticed about scowl is a lot of the times when good things happen, Scal is nearby. Like he might not be the one who scored. He might not be the one who got the rebound. But when you like watch highlights, Scal is one of the people that's often nearby. And I just think that he's in a really great situation right now. And I absolutely think that he could be one of those guys who really, you know, a lot of everybody does better pretty much when they get to Portland. But I think he's somebody who could really blossom, um, you know, to the next level, not just like, Oh, play well, get a good contract. But I think this could be a really great place for him to um, live up to some of the, what people were saying about him when he first came in the league. No, I, I agree. I mean, 
with with some of the the big things that haunted Scal through his career going back to Kentucky was just kind of the mental toughness uh aspect of his game I mean all the physical traits are there and I think it's a testament to how he's adapted and played so well here because I don't think it's easy to be you know the third you're starting out as a third fourth guy on the depth chart and to be that next man up mentality and come in and perform well really kind of puts a lot of the questions I had about him at ease um, as far as offensively I think he plays perfectly inside Stotts' system he knows exactly or basically knows where he needs to be and he's familiar with how the offense works so he's able to kind of he's the only big man so far this year that has done anything off a short roll I mean Whiteside is all the way to the rim and, and Tolliver's picking and popping. So there, I believe it was the San Antonio game. He, you know, got the ball in the short roll and looked around for a pass, hit an elbow jumper. I mean, that's just something they haven't had since Nurkic really left. Um, defensively, I still think there's, it's, there's a work in progress. I, I, I think some of his spatial awareness as far as where he needs to be on the roll and where he needs to cut off angles still needs work, but that's all stuff that is going to come with experience, and that's that whole defensive unit gelling together that's going to improve that. Right, and he's still getting called for, you know, moving screens and all, you know, all that. That's going to take some time to work out, but I really like the intensity with which he's watching the veterans and the people who he's playing alongside. I mean, just starting at... I think it was a, the first preseason game against Denver. I remember watching Damian like point to exactly where he wanted Scal to go and Scal going right there. And he just always seems very uh, connected and engaged with uh, whoever is out there on the floor. Like he's really actively learning while he's out there. Yeah, that situational awareness piece is super, super important. Knowing where to be for rebounds, when someone's driving to the hoop, if you're either two steps too far behind them or two steps too far in front of them, you could be getting in their space or not be their position for the rebound. And that kind of stuff, I see Scal doing really, really well, you know, boiling down to like, I don't know, basketball positional instincts. It seems like he has that, which is super encouraging. And related to this question about the Blazer center rotation, we did get a question from, I love this name, Blazer. Blazers legend and hella cool guy at the hella cool guy <laughs> asks, is Moses Brown going to be a viable solution to our injury problems at the four and five? Or do the Blazers look to sign another veteran player to fill in? Steve, start with you. What do you think about that? So I've been watching a lot of whatever clips I can get a hold of outside of Frisco coming out of Frisco right now where Moses Brown and Jalen Horde are right now working out with the Texas legends. Um, I, I just don't think it's feasible to really, I, I think he can come in and, you know, play garbage time for right now, but that that's quite a learning curve for these, these young guys. That being said, I think once the opportunity opens for 10 day contracts, I think the Blazers are definitely going to be a team that utilizes those. And you're going to bring in some of these journeyman kind of specialist guys to, you know, if you need a guy to come in with there's foul trouble to get, you know, a few quick rebounds and run the court, you can, you know, bring a guy in. If you like him, you can bring him back for another 10 days. I, I think that's more of the way that they want to approach this. Judging by how they went about things last year, I think they like having that extra roster spot open for as long as possible. And kind of everything is geared to what it looks like will be a major trade at the deadline. And I don't see them trying to fill that position either by calling up either Jalen Horde or Moses Brown permanently or, uh, and converting their two way contracts or, or signing a veteran guy like a Joe, Joakim Noah to fill that roster spot for the year. And when are teams allowed to sign 10 days? Is that in December? I believe it's after the G league showcase. So that will be early December, I believe. Okay, Tara, what do you think? Is Moses Brown the solution? And by the way, they may need a player to sop up those garbage time minutes. So would it be him or do you think it might be somebody else? Maybe Pau Gasol getting healthy? I mean, I know he's at the end of his career. What are you thinking about that backup 4-5 position? Well, to start off with, from your mouth to God's ears, that there will be garbage time uh, because so far everything has just been right down the wire pretty much. So um, I'm Hopefully hoping Hopefully the that good kind of garbage time. Yes, exactly. That's what I was going to say. Is I'm hoping that we're going to have the garbage time where Dame can sit for a lot of the fourth quarter because he's gotten them enough of a uh, lead and he doesn't feel like he has to go in. I agree with Steve. I think the Blazers historically have been and, and Stotts have been reluctant to rush young players uh, into situations that they're 
they're maybe not quite ready for. So I think it would be more likely that they'll uh, try to figure out what to do with their current players or, you know, if Zach Collins is going to be out for a while, bringing in somebody else rather than uh, relying on uh, Brown to come in and do it. As much as I love watching him, I just don't know that he'd be ready for that uh, kind of a situation. I'm interested to see how much Pau Gasol has left to give. And again, he doesn't need to be a world beater. If he could, I mean, the Blazers are going to need, you know, 8, 10, 12 minutes at center at a time. And maybe Pau Gasol can bring that. Uh, let's bring this around on our last question here uh, to get you both out of here after this. To the Blazers' best player, Damian Lillard, has been having quite a season. I know the sample size is small, but if you follow I Like the Blazers at I Like the Blazers on Twitter, we tweeted out a little bit earlier that through five games, Damian Lillard is averaging career best in points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, turnovers, as in less turnovers, and free throws. Tara... Is this just a continuation of how Damian Lillard has like gotten slightly better and slightly better every year? Is this a function of the team having a lot of change and he kind of senses that he needs to be a little bit extra? Like, wh what do you chalk this up to? The second, I am super stressed out about how much he is having to play and come in and uh, finish games right now. Uh, you know, that's what I, I kind of alluded to that earlier. I love that he can do it. Like, don't get me wrong. And I'm sure that, you know, he is, you know, I don't know if, if he's fine, but he understands that right now, if the Blazers are going to log as many wins as they can early on in the season, he needs to do that. But Boy, it stresses me out to see him have to do that game after game after game. And I love the fact that he has these numbers, but I really it's making me nervous, makes my stomach hurt how he's been getting them. And like I said, I wish that it was like, you know, back during when Steph was getting MVPs and he only played three quarters. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm hoping for those days ahead for Damien so he can get some rest. Yeah, I think it just comes down to sustainability right now. I mean, Lillard's fourth quarters through this season have been unreal. He leads the league in fourth quarter, fourth quarter point scoring, just over 12 points per game. I mean, he's consistently kind of been in that top 10 list throughout his career. Uh, Jason Quick had a great tweet about it, I believe, yesterday or early this morning. But really, I, I just get worried about long-term and getting into playoff series and against contenders where – Portland doesn't have a way to manufacture easy baskets. Like that was something that Yusuf Nurkic or even Ennis Cantor, you could throw the ball to them in the post and, you know, give Dame a playoff. Now, ideally a guy like Rodney Hood has shown glimpses of being able to create his own shot. Mario Hazoni on the second unit has shown glimpses of that. But once you get into a playoff series where you're facing the Kawhi Leonard's and the LeBron James's of the world, those are the guys that have this big wing presence that can get those easy baskets. And when you're asking Damian Lillard, a player of his size, to exert that type of effort this early in the season, it is a little worrisome for the long term. But for now, it's always nice to see that that, you know, your star player has that extra gear and knows how to get to it and get you back in games, because that's what they're going to have to do before this whole roster comes together is they're going to have to win a few games ugly until everybody really kind of knows what's going on and, you know, who's injured and who is going to be there for the long term. Well, and about manufacturing easy points, one thing I've wondered is whether the Blazers have been talking to CJ McCollum about, hey, man, you need to get to the line more. Because when you look at CJ McCollum's career free throw attempts, I just pulled them up right now. He's averaging a career high in free throw attempts this year at 3.8. He's getting the line only two times per game for someone who's scoring 23 points a game. I, I Is it just me? I mean, I like, I, again, like I'm not trying to put too much pressure on him. I just feel like maybe they can get some points that way. If he just, I don't know, maybe he's too small. What's, I don't know. I, I think the, the league is obviously emphasizing uh, creating space with the off arm on guys who drive to the basket. And, you know, James Harden gets a lot of attention in that, rightfully so, but CJ McCollum is low-key one of the best forearm throwers in the NBA, I feel like. And, I, and I've noticed it in a couple games this year where that first offensive foul call he gets, 
he is he attacks the basket much differently after that and i i'm hoping after you know the kind of this two week mark goes by and the referees kind of reconvene and talk about em- points of emphasis maybe they'll ease up a little bit on what's going on there and I, maybe that will transition hopefully to more mccollum attacks at the basket tara any thoughts on mccollum I mean, that was one of the things that I was hoping that we were going to see coming into the season because, you know, every, you know, how every year people add a few more tools to the toolkit and learning how to get to the free throw line. It seems like it's probably about time for CJ to concentrate on figuring that out. And it's a skill and it's something that I totally believe that, you know, CJ, as much as he's a student of the game, will figure out. Um, and then he's also got to make those free throws. He, he's, uh, he even mentioned it on his own podcast that uh, he was having a hard time with those clutch free throws. So I'm hoping that by the end of the season, maybe sooner rather than later, we have seen him uh, increase his ability to get to the line as well as finish those, especially clutch free throws. One more quick question and then out. I, I lied. There's one more. So the, I want to talk about the Blazers schedule briefly. They have the, the well, basically their schedule has been and will continue to be pretty road heavy through the end of this month, through the end of, of November. Um, but let's not look that far ahead. Let's talk about just the next five games and what, what you think they're going to be doing in those five games. So in the next five, they have tonight. 76ers, there's no Joel Embiid, but there's also not going to be any Zach Collins. And, and Hassan Whiteside, I think, is still up in the air, said the 76ers and on the road with the Warriors, who we know Steph Curry is going to be out for, for a long time and, and maybe Draymond Green, too, with a finger injury. Um, then at the Clippers, then back at home for the Nets and the Hawks. So the next five games, 76ers, Warriors, Clippers, Nets, Hawks, Terra. How do you expect these next five games to go for the Blazers? Oh, I don't know. You know, I don't make predictions, Brandon. (laughs) Oh, come on. I need one hot take from you. One. (laughs) My hot take is by the next, by the end of the next five games, I want us to have a definitive nickname for Scala VCA. Okay, that's that's completely fair, uh, Steve. You you can you can choose to artfully dodge the question. I love your political instincts are amazing, Tara. Um, Steve, what what do you think about these next five games? What comes to mind for you? No predictions needed, but just what what comes to mind when you think of those teams? I, I think the home games that the Blazers do have, they need to take care of business, and that and that starts tonight. Yes. It is going to be a battle of no bigs tonight is what it's looking like. But these are games that the Blazers have to win in front of the home crowd. And I expect the new role players, role players always play better at home. And some of these new guys really, you know, yes, the preseason crowds are loud and opening night was loud. But these guys haven't really got to fully experience, you know, what the Moda Center or what the Rose Garden has to offer. So I'm, I'm hopeful that. They, they take care of business at home. That would be my takeaway for the next five games. You know, speaking of bigs, I hear Brian Freeman is still available, still remains unsigned. <laughs> uh, Blazers Edge writer Brian Freeman. Okay, that's it. I, I appreciate both of you so much. Uh, Tara Bone Biggs and Steve DeWald, both of Blazers Edge and Tara Bone Biggs, also uh, one of the leaders of Women Hoops and Talks. Um, if people wanted to reach out to you, starting with Tara, then to Steve, and they want to reach out to you, interact with you, connect with your work, how would people do that? The best way to uh, find me is on Twitter at T-C-B-B-I-G-G-S. So that's two B's and two G's. And please reach out to me and let me know if you have a preference for what we're going to call Scal, because Scal totally needs a nickname. Um, and then also I will just mention that the next Women's Hoops and Talks meetup uh, is on the 12th of November. That is coming up pretty soon. We meet at the McMinimans on Broadway and we watch games together. It's a lot of women attend but uh, men are welcome to come too we just uh, center the voices and the takes of women during those uh, events so thanks for having me on brandon appreciate it heck yeah and steve where could people reach out to you uh i'm the same on twitter uh, at steve d hoops um i'm on blazer's edge way too much devoting way too much of my free time to that so i usually check the comments on there if you have a question about something i wrote or or a comment as long as it's nice <laughs> or to a degree <laughs> um uh but yeah that, that's the best way to get a hold of me i don't have anything else too exciting going on so that's where i'll be awesome thank you both so much thank you 
Thank you again so much to Tara Bowen Biggs and to Steve DeWall, the Blazers Edge. I really appreciated both of their time. The fact that they made time to talk to me at the same time, I very much appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, thank you both so much. Uh, we will see what happens tonight against the 76ers. Obviously, shorthanded without Joel Embiid, but the Blazers are also shorthanded without Zach Collins and Hassan Whiteside, who had that sprained knee. Hopefully, both those players will be back soon because they're going to be relying a lot on Scal, as we talked about during the interview in that interim time. But until then, that's about it for tonight. If you want to reach out to I Like the Blazers, pretty simple, at I Like the Blazers on Twitter and Facebook. You can also send emails at I Like the Blazers at gmail.com. But what's really going to help is if you please give us those five star reviews. It doesn't matter which way you're getting your podcasts, if it's Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Lots of other ways, Spotify, Stitcher, CastBox, Radio Public, can't even name them all. But if you could please subscribe and give us a five-star review, that's what helps people see the show, and it really does make a huge difference, and so I would appreciate it. Um, And yeah, that is about it. Again, I appreciate all of you. Oh, wait a minute. No, I'm sorry. We had one question that I didn't get to, and I'm going to pull that up right now because I asked for questions, and you all sent them in, and I really appreciated it. So we got to one question on the show, but we had... Another one where, oh, it's from Christian Gmelin from uh, Peeps and Plaid podcast. I appreciate that. From Christian's asks if Nurk were magically healthy, no lingering issues, or no easing into it. What would you want his minutes split with Hassan Whiteside to be? Who starts? Who finishes? Does, does Scal still get playing time? I would think if Nurk were magically perfectly healthy, you'd probably want his minutes to go back to what they were when he was perfectly healthy he was an extremely effective player he was the Blazers second best player last year one of the most effective defensive players in the league last year by some metrics which is pretty surprising also an extremely effective offensive player he was learning how to pass a little bit more so yeah I mean I would want to see him play all the minutes he got last year Um, I'd want Hassan Whiteside to be the permanent full-time backup big and that probably squeezes Scal out unless Zach Collins as he is right now is injured which is kind of a because I do like Scal as a backup. Now, where this might change is if the Blazers decide that they want to trade us on Whiteside at some point during the year, which they definitely could. He's an expiring contract. There are teams around the league that would want some salary relief. If the Blazers are thinking that they have to maximize Dame's prime right now, they may be more than willing to take on a large contract. Look at what's happening with the Pistons. Is Reggie Jackson going to be out, I think, what, several weeks, maybe even months with a bad back? Does that mean that a player like Blake Griffin is on the block or even their max player Andre Drummond stranger things have happened you don't know and I well okay let me back up Andre Drummond is not someone who fits on this Blazers team at all Blake Griffin ostensibly could if you were healthy or a player like Kevin Love or a player like you know name player X on team Y that wants to shed long-term salary and the Blazers have some young pieces they have their own draft picks and they may be willing to trade again an expiring contract like Hassan Whiteside to make to, to facilitate that trade so that's what I'd be thinking to short answer your question I want Nurk to be playing as many minutes as he had when he was playing last year if he came back healthy at his best he is the Blazers if not their second best player um, which he was last year again by the way then their second most important player because of what he brings he is critical to this team's success he truly is so long term all right so with that uh i wow i really got under the gun with that but thank you all again thank you to everybody who sent your questions and until next time this is i like the blazers i am your host brandon goldner thank you all so much and enjoy your weekend